So, you want dynamite darts content? Well, Alex Moss and Burton DeWitt have you covered. Love these guys. For bullseyes, bounce outs, and darting brilliance, keep it right here. You are listening to the Weekly Darts Cast. Now, I'm Canadian and often get asked how Canadians call out a maximum, a 180? Well, it sounds something like this. A hundred, eh? T. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Weekly Darts Cast, sponsored by Dart Wolf. I'm Alex Moss and back alongside me this week, it is the Dart Statistician, the Dart Strava King, Burton DeWitt. Welcome back. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Just uh, enjoying a morning here in uh, Oregon. How are you, Alex? I'm doing all right. Thank you. The, the darts just keeps coming this year. We've got lots to get to. We've got free guests on the show as well. You can hear from Yella Klaassen, who you spoke to last week, Burton, just after he's winning the Dutch Open. You're also going to hear from two players that we're going to see in action this weekend in the World Seniors, Keith Della and Peter Everson joining us on the show. But let's start off the show by looking back at some darts that we have seen, and that is the World Series. We saw the Dutch Darts Masters and another title for Dimitri Vandenberg going back-to-back on the World Series brings us to our question of the week, which we've been asking our listeners on Twitter. Will Dimitri Vandenberg be the next first-time winner of the PDC World Championship? What do you reckon? <laughs> it's I love this question because we ask something like this a lot, and it's a, it's a difficult one to say because who knows who's going to end up being the next first time. But he's in the conversation. But so are a lot of people right now, and not just people who've never won – the world championship, but even some players who haven't won majors, the best player in the world right now. Well, maybe it is Dimitri Vandenberg after winning the last two world series, but him aside, I think Michael Smith has that argument having won almost everything other than the last two world series events that he's played in over the last couple months, uh, winning three players championship events, a Euro tour, a world series event, a premier league night, not enough to get him to the playoffs, but certainly if it would have been, he would have been the favorite uh, to bring it home. And there's no reason to think Michael Smith's going to slow down anytime soon. Uh, he's been playing at a phenomenal standard since the World Championships, other than a little dip earlier this year. But he's recovered from that. Michael Smith, as of right now, is very likely the favorite to win the World Championship. So if that holds up then, and he follows the form, then no, Dimitri Vandenberg is not the next uh, new winner of the World Championship. But he's as every chance winning back-to-back World Series events is, well, that speaks for itself. I don't have to say it's impressive. It clearly is because you're beating the best players in the world uh, to do so. Okay, there were a lot of upsets in the Dutch Darts Masters, uh, but Dimitri Vandenberg didn't fall victim to them. And there weren't as many upsets, really any, in Denmark uh, right before that, and he won that anyway. Uh, He's also made his first Euro Tour final this year. He's made another final on the floor. He keeps getting himself in position to win titles almost every week and it's now turning into titles in the last two world series events uh dimitri vandenberg will be alive uh in a couple weeks to not defend his world match play title but to defend the title money that he won two years ago he'll also be live in pretty much every tournament the rest of the year because he's one of the best players in the world uh is he the next first time winner odd say no but it wouldn't be surprising if he were he has the game and he has the uh, stamina to go in long distance matches and keep up a high level. That's why he won the world match play, which is the second longest format uh, of any of the majors. Maybe the Grand Prix is on par uh, having to win five sets, or at least 15 legs, but he had to win 18 legs to win the world match play title. And he was able to do that. And he nearly defended the title a year after that. Uh, Dimitri Vandenberg has every chance to become world champion this year. And, He'll have every chance for the next few years after that. He is a class player. He's one of the best players in the world. But I think there are players who haven't won the world championship that right now I would put ahead of him as more likely. I said Michael Smith. I'll also say uh, Johnny Clayton. Um, And there might be a couple other players who are in the conversation. But I think Dimitri Vandenberg will be a world champion one day. And it wouldn't surprise me if I'm wrong and he was one come January. Dimitri Vandenberg, he is a class player, but he is one of many class players, and you listed a few of them there. Michael Smith, Johnny Clayton, you've also got in there Luke Humphreys, who's won a few titles on the stage this year on the Euro Tour. Nathan Aspinall, a former major winner, he's coming back into some form. Damon Hetter, we've just seen win the World Cup. James Wade, of course, you can never write James Wade off yet to win a, a world title. Danny Noppert, 
just won the UK Open. So, and that list goes on. There are a lot of quality players in, in the field in the PDC at the moment. And it is quite wide open at the moment. You've got players that go into a bit of form. We just saw Michael Smith go on that run. Dimitri van der Berg is on a run at the moment. And yeah, we, we go through this question a few times when a player's on a good run. Are they going to be the next player to win that Sid Waddell trophy for the first time? And you think back to the last two years and then players that I just listed, there probably was times when we were saying they're going to be the next one to do it. But as we know, it is all about peaking for those two weeks at the end of December, start of January. Peter Wright said it once, you just got to play OK darts for two weeks and it can change your life forever. And I think all those players can play OK darts. They can play world-class darts. And I think looking at what Dimitri's done the last couple of weeks, yeah, it's pretty impressive going back-to-back, winning these World Series titles. And you'd probably say that the first one that he won, where he did beat more of the bigger names, if you like, that's more impressive. But you look at what he'd done at the weekend in Amsterdam, winning that title, and to, I guess, really hold himself together. Because you look at that opening night, and we saw six of the eight PDC representatives all go out in the first round. We saw Michael Smith go out, Peter Wright, Johnny Clayton, Michael Van Gogh, and Gohan Price. So going into that final session... Dimitri would have been probably the favourite with the bookmakers, a favourite with a, a lot of people to go on and lift the title, but there were still three games to play, three games to win to get to that title. And each game going up against a, a Dutch player, going up against the Dutch crowd who were desperate to see one of their players go on and, and lift the title and to hold himself together, to win those games and to play at the level that he did, 98 average in the first one. 103 average in the second one and then in the final raising it even a little bit more 104 average and dropping just five legs in those three games as well against some top quality players Jermaine Watamina, Danny Knopper, Dirk van Dijvenbode as well who was playing well at the weekend that takes some doing and yes it's still a long way to go before the world championship but it's probably what he's done Dimitri van der Berg is maybe just anyone that was maybe doubting his credentials given that he wasn't in the Premier League we've not seen a, a lot of him on TV so far this year, just giving them a tap on the shoulder and saying, I'm still here. I'm still one of the best players in the world. And when the world championship does come round, I'm going to be one of the contenders to lift that title. Now let's uh, spend a second talking about the runner up uh, for Dirk van Dijvenboda, second TV final following on the world Grand Prix final a couple years ago. How close do you think he is though, to winning that first stage title in the PDC? Yeah, I don't think he's far away at all. And, we were speaking a similar question about this. I think it was when Luke Humphreys won one of his three Euro Tour titles and we were talking about who could be the next first time winner on the European Tour and Dimitri van der Berg's name came up, as did Dirk van Dijvenboda's name and as did Damon Hett's name and two of those have won titles on TV, all three of them yet to win on the Euro Tour. And I think with, with Dirk, he's someone that is getting close, isn't he? We, we saw him get to that World Grand Prix final a couple of years ago this was his next final on TV. So it's been a, a little while between finals, but we have seen that when he is on form, when he does produce his top level, he is capable of, of beating anyone in the world. I mean, you look at what he's done quite recently, the the World Cup, he had that 110 average. He had a, a 107 average against Michael Smith. OK, he lost that game, one of the, the Pro Tour finals a couple of weeks ago. But if you're producing games of that standard, you are going to win more often than not. And looking at the Euro Tour, I think he's had three quarterfinals this year. More often than not, he is losing with a high average, a 95 plus average. So he's been playing well for a little while now. And we saw it at the weekend as well. There was pretty much all the games that he won. He did it in impressive style. The game against Peter Wright won that game 6-3 with a 95 average. The game against Martin Kliermacher, okay, it dropped below 90. But when he had to be clinical, when the doubles had to go he he was taking them and I think the most impressive game was the the game against James Wade the semi-finals it's a, a really close game James Wade's taken out 140 to uh to go 6-5 up to hold throw Dirk was sitting on 25 to break and there would have been some players that would have seen that shot go in and the head would have dropped they'd have given up but, but we saw Dirk hold his throw in 14 darts force that decider and James Wade in, in a decider, you, you're probably fancying him to go on and win that final leg, but kicks off with a 41. Dirk throws in a, a 140, and he, he played that last leg really well. Okay, it was a 17 dart, so not the best leg of the match, but after that first visit from both players, he was in control right until the end and took out that 72 
confidently in, in two darts to win it seven to six. So that's a big scalp for him. And OK, the final didn't go very well for him, losing eight two with a, a 94 average. And Dimitri just got off to such a good start in that final and he couldn't come back. But yeah, I think we're seeing Durkey is proving himself to be one of those top players. You know, he's a, a top 16 player at the moment. Top eight is uh, that's the, the next step. And he is going to have to have more runs in the, the major ranking events to get there. But Euro Tour title, I think he is going into these weekends as a, a genuine contender to win one. We've seen that on the stage, he is a character. He loves playing on the stage. He, he shows his emotions, his heart on his sleeve. Maybe that could be to his detriment sometimes, but we have seen at times as well that he can hold it together in those crunch moments. He can beat these top players. And if you're doing that and you're doing it regularly, you have got a shot of winning one of these titles. Yeah, and you mentioned his... Uh averaging over 95 more often than not. And I'll just go based on the players' championship events. I know this question's about winning a stage title, but there's a bigger, there's been, there's more players' championship events and there's more matches that you play in them. So there's a bigger uh, pool of matches we can look at. And just looking at this season, uh, dividing it up to the first 10 events and the seven since then. In the first 10 events, he played 24 matches. So averaged uh, winning about a match and a half per them. And half the time he averaged under 95, half the time he averaged over 95, including three times averaging over 100. In the seven tournaments since then, he's played 29 matches. That's an average of four matches per tournament. So that's an average of three matches. That's averaging winning his board over the last seven players' championship events. And you mentioned he's won a title. He's made a final during that time. Of those 29 matches, only eight times has he averaged under 95. Nearly half the time, 14 of those 29, he's averaged over 100 with a further seven matches over 95. He's added a good three to five points on his average over the last couple months in the Players' Championship events. And it's shown elsewhere. It obviously showed this past weekend in the Netherlands in the World Series event. The bigger concern, though, is can he keep this? Can he consistently play at that level? If he consistently plays at the level he's played at the last couple months, he is a top eight player. He might even be better than that. But if he regresses to how he was for the first few months of the year, sure, he's a top 32 player, but not much more than that. And that was a bit of the consistency problems that we've seen from him over the last couple of years. When he's on, he is unbelievably good. He is one of the best players in the world, but he hasn't been on enough. That said, to win a Euro Tour event, you only have to be on for a couple of days. Same for a couple of the other TV events, particularly the ITV majors, the European Championship for the UK Open. And his A game is that good that if he can just find it for a weekend, he'll win a he'll win a Euro Tour or he'll win a major. He even made the final of a week-long event in the World Grand Prix a couple of years ago. I don't think it's too far off. And playing at the level he's been playing at for the last couple months, it's almost surprising he hasn't managed to win one. He made it to this final. He's obviously also won a Players' Championship event during that time. So he's it's, it is coming. I don't think he needs to improve any to win a title compared to how he's playing right now. But he needs to be able to bring this level of game more often and for a longer period of time. As I said, right now, he looks like a top eight player. Can he maintain that is the question. Uh, He definitely has the game to. Will he, though, I guess is more the question than can he. From one Dutchman that's looking to win their first stage title to someone that has won titles on the stage, here's our chat with the recently crowned Dutch Open champion and the former world champion, Jelle Klaassen. I'm joined today by the newly crowned Dutch Open champion, Jelle Klaassen. Jelle, how are you? Uh, I'm very good, thank you. And uh, congrats on the title and thanks for joining us. Uh, Only one place to start, and that, of course, is with that win at the Dutch Open a little over a week ago now since you won the title in Assen. Uh, What did it mean to you to add the Dutch Open to your CV? Oh, I think everyone who would win the Dutch Open would be very happy because it's one of the toughest tournaments to win. And uh, I think if you play WDF uh, and you you look at the ranking tournaments, uh, that that's the one to win. So uh, now I'm I'm really happy with this title. And we'll come back to the Dutch Open in a bit, but let's rewind back to when we last had you on the show. And it was uh, during the UK Open, just after you won through three rounds as a Riley's qualifier. Uh, Devin Peterson put an end to your run later that day, despite you averaging almost 100. Uh, what did you take away from that day in Minehead? 
Pooh, I, I played really well. Uh, I think uh, I, uh, I, I, it felt more that, that I lost that game than that Devin won it because uh, I, I played even that game I was scoring so well, but I was missing so many doubles. Uh, at the break, it was 5 all, and I should have been 8-2 up. Uh, but no, it was great to be on stage again and uh, playing good darts, so uh, that was uh, really uh, a confidence boost. Of course, and after that, it was back to the Challenge Tour, and you had a decent weekend, a pair of last six teams and a quarterfinal from the five events. But uh, how tough has it been getting to grips with playing the Challenge Tour in those two uh, tournaments a day, especially coming from uh, a long time on the Pro Tour? Uh, it was tough. It's still tough. It's it's uh, yeah. It it's maybe sounds crazy, but it's it's difficult to uh, get motivated. But uh, uh, it's getting there. Uh, I, I just see this year now as a year to go get back in shape and uh, get back on the pro tour. Uh, but beginning of the year, I was really disappointed and I didn't really feel like playing Challenge Tour. But uh, yeah, I think maybe now it's a good thing for me to get the yeah enjoy the darts again and get the form back. Uh, the, the, I, I think the, the, the difficult thing is uh, uh, playing Q School is such a uh, gamble because it's just one week or or yeah for for me it was only three or four days and yeah just have to be lucky that you're informed on that moment uh, because the whole next two years depends on it or the next year depends on that only three four days of good darts so I think uh, uh, yeah Q school wasn't good for me I, I didn't play well so uh, I think they they should change the rules about uh, getting into the pro tour, but uh, I, can, I can get into that uh, discussion uh, another time. Well, it's definitely a fair point. It's one that a lot of people have made. Uh, but even though you're you fell off the tour this year, you've still been able to play in some of the events, particularly of note being uh, two appearances on the Euro Tour. The first of those in Stuttgart, you picked up a win over uh, Callan Ritz, who won two titles last year, and took Rob Cross all the way to a last leg decider. How good was it to be back playing um, in front of big crowds again on the Euro Tour and playing well? Uh, I did. That that never gets old. Uh, I think the Euro Tour is maybe the the the, the best tour to play on. Uh, normally, you have the best crowds in Germany uh, and all the other places, and it's just yeah, it's just one of the best places to play tournaments. Uh, so it it was great to be back there, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, there are a few more qualifiers left. So hopefully I will uh, qualify for a couple of more. Of course, and let's get on to the WDF side of things. You said to Alex at Minehead that you planned on playing the big WDF events this year, and we saw you made a final in Denmark, deep runs at the Isle of Man and in Switzerland. Um, how have you found it to be back playing those events again? Uh, <laughs> it's it's more relaxing than, than playing in the PDC because uh, in the PDC is really uh, all about... Uh, the ranking and uh, uh, yeah, just making money because it's your work. Uh, it's still my work, but uh, I, I just saw this year as uh, I'm only going to play the big WDF tournaments and try to qualify for Lakeside. Uh, it wasn't my goal because my goal is still to qualify for uh, the Ali Pelli and uh, get a tour card. So uh, uh, if I would qualify for Ali Pelli uh, through the qualifiers, uh, I can't play Lakeside, so that's why I never focused on Lakeside. But it's a, uh, it's a nice uh, bonus uh, if 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 I can't make uh, Ali Pelli. Well, hope, hopefully you get to both. Now, uh, you mentioned playing some of the big opens. There's none bigger or very few bigger than the Dutch Open. This is the first one back since COVID, so not surprisingly, the entries were still down, but still a big turnout. How do you approach though a, an event with a field that big? Uh, yeah, it's. I think if if you're a seated, I wasn't a seated player, but uh, as a name, I was one of the top players. So uh, and and because I I I played the national ranking, and I'm in the top of the national ranking. Uh, I got VIP, and they always put me on the TV lane. So I had a little bit of a fun, a advantage uh, on that part on the Saturday because all my opponents they had to play on the TV lane, of course. And uh, I think uh, most of them were pretty nervous. So, uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, 
they didn't play their best game. So uh, on the Saturday to qualify for the Sunday, uh, it, it went pretty easy. Now, a quick count says you won eight games just to make the semifinals in the singles. Um, and there on the main stage, you played Tybalt Trickle, who was the uh, Lakeside finalist, lost the last set to Cider he did at Lakeside. He took the first set 3-0 to, in a race to two. What was going through your head at that point when he was just a set away? Uh, I think I played nine games before the semifinal, but <laughs> that doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it was it was tough to get used to the distance because uh, he already played the final of the pair. So he already felt good on stage and uh, he showed it in the first set. He, he hit everything. He had, a, I think, a 1-14 uh, finish, a uh, 1-3-8 and a 1-3-5. So uh, I was thinking to myself, if, if he keeps on playing like this and I keep on playing like this, it's going to be a quick uh, semifinal. But... I think uh, uh, at that moment, the uh, set system was good for me because I thought, okay, this was just one set. If I just win the next set, uh, it's uh, one all and uh, it's still an open game. So, uh, yeah, and I think uh, experience on stage uh, made a big difference. Yes, indeed. And you mentioned that it was just one set. He nearly won the next set, uh, missing a couple darts, but you took out a double-double finish uh, to force that last set. Uh, going into the last set, did you feel like the tide was turning? Uh, to be fair, I, I felt good the second set because I, I missed five darts to win that set 3-1. And uh, then I gave him the chance on, I think, on 76. Uh, he had two darts on double eight for the match, but they were more close to double 16 than double eight. So it looked like he had a little bit of pressure. And when I took that set, I thought, OK, uh, I feel it's really going my way now. And uh, even though he still had a 12 dart finish, uh, the, the first leg of the third set, uh, it, it, I still felt like I was going to win this game. And uh, yeah, I think I had a 11 dart leg and then I broke him and I kept my own leg. So not, uh, after I won the second set, I really felt uh, like I was going to win that uh, game. Yeah, and you mentioned the 11 dart, or you won those last three legs in a combined 40 darts. How pleasing was it to produce that high level when you needed it the most? It's always nice to, if you, if, if you stay calm and you can still do that under pressure, uh, it, it, it really gives you uh, confidence, uh, uh, and that's what I need <laughs> this year. So, no, it, it felt really good and yeah, it, it was just a confirmation for all the work I did in the last few months. Uh, and I, I've been playing well. And yeah, that weekend, everything came together. Uh, I played well. I had a little bit of luck. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's always a great feeling if uh, everything goes your way. Uh, we'll get to the final in a second. Uh, but we saw that you walked on to a new song, uh, switching over to Gangnam Style. Was that just a one-off for this weekend or is making that a permanent change? No, it was only a one-off because uh, my kids were there, and uh, the last few days, weeks, they they're crazy about that song and doing the dance all day. So uh, they, I, I told them if I get on stage, if I uh, make the semifinals, I will uh, uh, put on Gangnam Style just for them. So uh, they had a great uh, great evening. Well, you mentioned you did it for your kids, and obviously. A uh, 3-0 whitewash over Mark Barilli and your kids were there on the stage to help to celebrate the win with you. How does that winning the Dutch Open with your family there uh, rank among your special moments you've had in the game? Yeah, I think I, I didn't play brilliant, but to, to win that big tournament with, with my kids on stage, uh, top two, three moments of my life. Uh, that, that was so great. I, I'm always very calm. And uh, even if I win a tournament, I'm always pretty, yeah, yeah, yeah st still calm. But when they came on stage, uh, I, yeah, I, I was from, from inside. I felt a little bit emotional. I was like, oh, <laughs> it was such a great moment. And then they loved it as well. They they were so proud. Of course. And uh, one difference with the uh, WDF compared to the PDC is that a lot of events, including at the Dutch Open, there's pairs. And you played alongside Luke Buying, making it to the last 32. Is there anything you can say um, about him? Was are you uh, friends with him or just someone that you needed a partner? Yeah, no, he's one of my best friends. Uh, he, we, we used to play local league together and uh, we, we play a lot of tournaments together. So, uh, no, I know him very well and uh, he's, he's a big talent, but 
uh, the last two or three years, uh, his confidence is a little bit down. So uh, uh, I always try to help him uh, get his confidence back. And uh, yeah, he's starting to play better again. But yeah, it, it was it was nice playing with him on the Dutch Open. Uh, we we lost the game. We shouldn't have lost, but uh, had that starts. Of course, and uh, you also mentioned before that you might be playing. Uh, tried to play a little soft tip this year. Have you entered any events yet, or any that you got your eye on? No, no, not yet. Uh, I'm looking for uh, some tournaments, maybe in the states to play, uh, because in in Europe the, there are not many big tournaments. Uh, but uh, the last few months I, I focused so much on uh, getting my form back with steel tip that I didn't want to play too many soft tip uh, games uh, because yeah, my throw is totally different with soft tip. So uh, now now I'm uh, feeling pretty good with the steel tip. Uh, I'm uh, gonna start uh, practicing again, and hopefully uh, if there's a big tournament somewhere. Uh, yeah, in the states or uh, really, it doesn't matter where. Uh, and and I don't have any challenge to or pro tour or uh, big uh, WDF tournament. Uh, I, I will definitely go uh, playing stuff tip. Oh, sounds good. And maybe maybe I'll go and try to lose to you in the first round if uh, that happens. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then one last question, uh, Alex wanted me to ask this. He said that when he was at Lakeside this year, he spoke with Ko Stompe, uh, who you played in your last Lakeside. And Ko said he walked out to Nickelback, you remind me, and chose it because he knew you planned to switch over to the PDC. Uh, did you know that story? No, no, uh, because uh, before the tournament, we didn't even know we were really going to the PDC. It wasn't... Yeah, set in stone. Uh, but uh, after I lost, uh, we uh, we went to the PDC. And uh, but I, I I didn't know that that was uh, why he played that song. Well, Yella, congratulations on uh, winning the uh, Dutch Open, and best of luck for the rest of the season. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks again to Yella for joining us. Now on to the women's series, and we saw the race for the first women's world match play conclude at the weekend, and two teenagers. Katie Sheldon, Chloe O'Brien edging out Trina Gulliver and Jane Densley for those last two spots in the field. What have you made of Katie Sheldon and Chloe O'Brien's season so far? It's an interesting one because you look at the statistics. Uh, they're not necess- especially Chloe O'Brien is not who you would have expect to get through. But 12 events is a decent amount to uh, set up for a qualification system. And even though statistically she's 37th in averages, averaging under 65 on on average, she's been able to get results. And she's been able to get results against some really good players. Very first event, made it to the semifinals, beating Laura Turner, beating uh, Karen Hammond. Uh, she made another semifinal at the second weekend. All right, not as many high-profile uh, uh, scalps, but wins are wins. And she's just consistently made it to the last 16 outside of that to keep getting the ranking money and continues to keep being Laura Turner's beating her, uh, what is it, three times this year so far? Yeah. Um, and she's in the field, including what was her best performance at this last event, and that was just enough to get her in. I, I don't know what to expect from Chloe O'Brien, but credit where credit's due, she got results, and that's the key thing. As far as Katie Sheldon goes, it's not really all that surprising. Uh, she's a player who's been on the up for some time, and her game is, well, her game just keeps improving. And she made her first final this year. She's also made a few other semifinals, particularly at the back end of the, well, I can't say the back end of the year because we still have a, a eight more women's series events to go, but at the back end of the qualification part of the year for the world match play. Like Chloe O'Brien, she's lifts her game when she needs to. And, you know, that's why she made the final. She beat uh, Fallon Sherrick in the semifinal when Fallon Sherrick was playing well. She's also beaten Laura Turner a couple times and noticing a trend here. Um, as far as, you know, the people you mentioned who didn't get in, you know, Trina Gulliver probably would have gotten through but didn't play the last uh, weekend. And that made a big difference. And we'll come on to it later, but there were a few other players who – Definitely can say they were unlucky to miss out. Makura Suzuki, who, like Trina Culliver, missed one weekend, ended up third in the averages, but she just kept getting beat by players who were either were playing phenomenally or, well, are the best players in the world. And that's why everyone who knocked out uh, Makura Suzuki uh, ended up qualifying, except for Maria O'Brien, who knocked her out in the final event. And 
Trina Gulliver, uh, but that's because, well, Trina Gulliver only went on and won that and didn't play the others. But Makuru Suzuki certainly was unfortunate to miss out, was playing at a very good standard. And you have to think if she had played all three weekends, she would have done enough. Um, and there were a few others who were unlucky to miss out. Uh, Corey and Hammond also just couldn't get enough results, but was playing at a good enough level. And biggest of all was uh, Rihanna Sullivan. But we will come more onto that later. But credit where credit's due. It's not a, not all about the stats. And Chloe O'Brien got enough done. Uh, but Katie Sheldon's the one to more look out for. Her A game is, at least right now, much ahead of where Chloe O'Brien's is. And Katie Sheldon has shown that she can beat anyone even when they're playing at their best. And that'll do her well because she's going to have to bring her A game against Fallon Sherrick, who, of course, as I mentioned, she's already beaten this year in that first match. So for Katie Sheldon, I think she's the player to really look out for. Chloe O'Brien, credit where it's due, but Katie Sheldon's the one who could go deep in this game. And there's question marks with Fallon Sherrick's game right now. Uh, we'll talk more about those as the women's world match play comes closer. But there are certainly question marks with where Fallon's game is right now. Katie Sheldon is not just there to make up the numbers. Uh, she's there to win a title. And I don't think I will tip her to do that, but at least not yet, but down the line, maybe. And go out and prove me wrong. Well, that is a sentence I never thought I would hear you say. It's not all about the stats, but that is right. And especially with, you'd probably say, Chloe O'Brien. I was looking back at her stats from last year, 2021 Women's Series. She averaged 62. She only played in one of the weekends, first nine average, 72. And then this year, so far, the 12 events, her average has been 64. First nine average, 72. So the, the first nine has been exactly the same. The overall average has, has gone up a couple of points, but... Look at what she's been able to achieve from these first three weekends. And as you say, she's picked up a, a few scalps along the way. She's had some good runs, a couple of semifinals, a, a couple of quarterfinals. And I think the, the biggest thing that you've got to take away from her performance is her run to get that last spot in the field is the last event of the whole weekend the, the before the cutoff. We saw Jane Densley, she had that spot, lost out in her first game to Rebecca Edwards and then it was all down to what the chasing pack could do. And for Chloe O'Brien, she was one of the players that was closer than the others to getting in. She had to make a quarterfinal to get into that spot. And that's if all the other players behind her hadn't gone further and, and done what they had to do. So there would have been pressure on her after seeing Jane Densley go out to know that it is sort of in her hands now. If she can get to a quarterfinal, that's put her in a, a really good position. And going into that last event, you touched on it first game Laura Turner someone that has already qualified for the the match play at that point she'd made back-to-back -back finals earlier on in the season and uh yeah you've got to tip her out off to a 14 data to hold 15 data to hold the last couple of legs they were a bit longer but the finishes we've got to point them out 110 with Laura Turner sat on 20 and then 112 to win the game Laura Turner sat on 60 so there's some you know good finishes under pressure to get the win and 80 average in that one OK, the next couple of games, they were uh, lower in the averages and there were some longer legs in there, but she held it together. She got the doubles, a, a few good finishes in there. I think there was a couple of 70-odd finishes against Rebecca Edwards and then the game against Juliet Findlay, the one that she had to win to move into those spots. She had a, a couple of good legs in there as well. I think there was an 82 finish in there as well. So what we can say is that she she is capable of taking out those finishes when she needs to and that's a sign of a good player and she's only 18 years of age so a lot more to come from her and Katie Sheldon out of the two yeah she's someone that we know a lot more about we've seen her a lot more and we've had her on the show recently as well and talked about last year's averages compared to this year's last year her average was 67 she had a semi-final quarter-final that was her best runs this year, she's put six points on the averages. She's up, up to a 73 average. The first nine average, she's put eight points on that. So she's gone from 76 to 84, and that is the fourth best from this field of players. So that's pretty impressive. And she's had a, a couple of semifinals, a, a runner-up in there as well. And she could have had even more. She had two semifinals with Lisa Ashton at the weekend, both games going 5-4. And in both games, she did have match starts to beat Lisa to make another final. So could have finished even higher on that order of merit, could have even won a title as well. But you know, there's a bit like Chloe, I think there's a, a lot more to come from Katie Sheldon. She is someone that is improving probably quicker, you'd say, than, than Chloe O'Brien at the moment. But 
they've both got in the field. They both deserve to be there from what they've done from those first three weekends. So, yeah, both are going to go up against the, the top two, Lisa Ashton, Fallon Sherrick on that stage at the Winter Gardens on Sky Sports. It's a, a massive opportunity for both those young players and, like I say, fully deserved. Well, another weekend and another pair of titles for Lisa Ashton, her sixth and seventh of the uh, season, including having won the last event on the Sunday all three weekends so far. Um, is she, though, the favorite to lift the title in Blackpool? Yeah, this is a very interesting one. And there was a market I don't think there is at the moment, but you would have Lisa Ashton and, and Fallon Sherrick. They would be the, the two front runners, wouldn't they? And they are, of course, on opposite sides of the draw. Lisa being the top seed, Fallon being the second seed. So I think the odds on them two meeting in the final would, would be pretty low. But you have got six other players in there that are going to have a say on that Sunday afternoon at the Winter Gardens. But looking at what they've done from the uh, the first three weekends of the year, seven titles for, for Lisa, as you say, three titles we've seen for Fallon. And Fallon had a, a lot more travelling at the weekend as well. I think she put a tweet up saying that she fell asleep at the, the tables at the Women's Series on that Saturday because she'd played the Friday night in Amsterdam, the World Series, travelled back very early, um, late Friday, early Saturday to play in that double header. So that was a, a busy weekend for her. Did come away with a, a title though, which is uh, good for her in that race to get one of those World Championship spots. But as far as who's going to be the favourite, it's a tricky one. I think on the floor, you'd, you'd back Lisa, wouldn't you? Considering the, the dominance that she's had on the Women's Series this year. But when it comes to a stage... We have seen a, a lot more of Fallon Sherrick on the stage this year playing in those World Series events. We've seen Lisa play a few of the, the World Seniors events she's going to be playing this weekend. But Fallon, she has been a little bit up and down on those World Series events. We've seen her turn up and beat a, a tour card holder, Darius Labanowskis. And then on the other hand, we've seen her go out early on a couple of them as well. So maybe a, a little bit inconsistent as far as the stage form, Lisa. We've not seen her get a win on stage on TV for a little while. So I think going into it, I don't think either of them I'd say would be a clear cut favourite than the other. And I think we've we've not seen these two play on stage, play on TV for a long time. So if we were to get a final between the two, I think a lot of darts fans would want to see it. And, uh, you know, it would be probably one of the most talked about games going into it if we did get that final on the Sunday afternoon. But I think if I was to give the edge to one of them, I think I probably would just give the edge to Lisa Ashton. It is a very, very slight edge, and it is just based on the the head to head in recent years. We've seen this year, we've seen Lisa win two out of the three games they've had on the Women's Series last year. She won, I think, five out of the six. So, and the overall record as well is heavily weighted in Lisa Ashton's favour. So, I think just going off the head to head, I would give the edge on this one to Lisa Ashton. But we all know Fallon Sherrick when she goes up on that stage. She she much prefers playing on the stage. We've, that's where we've seen her throw a lot of her best starts, and that's where we've seen her make a name for herself at Ali Pali, the, the Grand Slam, the, the World Series last year in Denmark as well. So when she gets up on that stage, we know that she is capable of producing a, a much higher level. So I, I, I think it's a tight one. But if I was to get swayed towards one or the other, I think I would just give the slight edge to Lisa for now. Yeah, I'm I'm in agreement, and I'm not as concerned about where Lisa's stage game might be right now. Yes, we haven't seen her on the stage in a while, but she has just a wealth of experience on the big stage, and she has to be coming into this with confidence. She's won more than half the events. She's been playing at the highest level of anyone in the field, including over Fallon Cherick, who's been her nemesis in the women's game over the last couple of years. Uh, so Lisa Ashton's going to I think Lisa Ashton will be able to bring that game that brought her four world titles to uh, Blackpool. And I think that'll do her world a good. And it certainly won't hurt her that she had two years of pro tour experience. Yes, she didn't get that many matches on the stage. One, because there weren't that many Euro tours and she didn't qualify for them. Um, and two, because other than the world championships, she didn't. Well, I guess also the UK Open. But other than the world championships, UK Open, she didn't qualify for the other TV events. But she knows what a PDC televised environment is like which really only lisa ashton among the rest of the sorry fallon sherrick among the rest of the field knows what it's like to play and laura turner knows what it's like to be at because she's been in commentary um at all the major events but none of the rest have played on tv at a major pdc event and 
as I started out with, Lisa Ashton is going to come in with the most confidence. I think she should be the favorite. Whether the bookmakers will make her that, whether the people betting will make her, that's another question because Fallon Sherrick is the biggest name in the game. And she has the best A game of anyone in women's starts. But she has been inconsistent this year. And we saw it added at its lowest in the last couple uh, World Series events. But that has been a long time coming. She's had a lot of performances like that on the Women's Series this year as well, which is why she's only won three events as opposed to half of them like she had each of the last couple of years. If Fallon Sherrick is able to get back that game that she was playing at at the end of last year when she made a World Series final, when she came within a couple legs of the semifinals and who knows, maybe even further at the uh, Grand Slam, then yes, Fallon Sherrick is the person to beat. And I wouldn't think anyone in this field would beat her. But she hasn't shown that she's playing that game this year. And a lot can change in a few weeks. But Still, that is a lot that would need to change. I think Lisa Ashton's a favorite. Among the rest of the people in the field, could they win? Sure. I mean, Lorraine Wynn Stanley has won a title this year. Uh, uh, Lene DeGroff has made a pair of tie- uh, finals. Uh, Laura Turner, as you mentioned earlier, made consecutive finals this year. Rian Griffiths made a final earlier this year. Katie Sheldon's made a final. Chloe O'Brien's the only one who hasn't made a final, but she's made a pair of semifinals and keeps going deep uh, more often than not. But none of them have the game of the top two. Uh, Lorraine Wynn Stanley is probably the most likely of the rest. And she won a title in, a, in an event where the other two were both playing. Um, no one else can say that. Of course, no one else in this field can say they won a title in the women's series at all. Uh, so maybe Lorraine Wynn Stanley is the next best bet. And, you know, she is a former world uh, master, former world number one. But Lisa Ash and Fallon Sherrick are the clear uh, – cream of the crop in the women's game right now and lisa ashton's coming in with in the better form so yeah i'm going to say lisa ashton is and sh- or at least should be the favorite and uh i would think that it's more likely than not i.e more than 50 percent chance that she ends up becoming the first women's world match play champion at the winter gardens next month we'll be talking a, a bit more about the women's world match play later with our listener questions but let's First, get to our next guest on the show. He is the former champion of the world. who will be playing in the World Seniors match play this weekend. Here's our chat with Keith Teller. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the 1983 champion of the world, Keith Teller. Thanks for the time, Keith. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks, Alex. Yourself? Doing good, thanks. And we're talking at the start of another big week in the World Seniors with the World Seniors match play taking place this weekend in Hull. You'll be in action on the opening night on Friday. How much are you looking forward to playing on the stage and in front of the cameras once again? Really looking forward to it. Um, I think Jason um, Tame and Jason Francis, the promoters, you know, they've got it right. Um, you know, some players play a preliminary because they might not have done so well in the events when they were in the past. Like, obviously, the World Championship, I'd won it, so I was obviously not playing the preliminaries and um, I lost in the final of the Masters to Eric, but my best record was the semi-final twice, once as a PDC, the match play, and once in the BDO. So, obviously, I'm in a preliminary round, which is a little bit more, one more hurdle to do, but, and uh, playing a very good player, Colin McGarry, who I think any any of the players you play that come through the playoff qualifiers, you know, you saw it happen with David Cameron, he won it, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I'm not worried really. I think if it's all about what I do personally, if I come out and play really well, I just feel that I'm getting more comfortable now um, playing again, Alex. I mean, I think if you ask some of our, some of the players, it's 14 years since we played on TV and the first one, um, I mean, I've really practiced. I practiced too hard maybe, you know, I put too much into it, you know, it was all, you know, everything was like, oh, any chance of a spare moment on the practice board, in the garage, on the practice board. And in a way, I, I got it wrong there. That was just too much. And um, so, and then the last one I played, um, obviously, Bob didn't play his, his best, but it's still nice to win the first game. And the second one against Richie Helson, um really, I had chances. Um, you know, I didn't take the chances early doors. I, I felt I could have won that match. So, but I felt more comfortable. So I feel that I'm going into this one better than I will be the other two. So I'm really looking forward to it. Good to hear. Well, there is lots to catch up on since we last had you on the show October last year, just before the launch 
of your book, 138 Game Shot in the Match. When we spoke, you said how excited you were for Darts fans to read it. What's the reaction been like to the book since it came out? Well, I've got to be honest, it's been really positive. I don't think I've had one negative, uh, either on Twitter or anyone. Um, they've all said that it was a great read because I think because, you know, without being big of my final, it's still the biggest viewing figures ever. I don't think that will ever get beat when I played Eric. And the, the you know, I was the underdog, and the British do love an, uh, you know, an underdog where I was like 80 to 1 in the bookies and come through to beat the top three players in the world, and they were the best three at the time. So I think people always kept asking me the, the question I've heard a million times should Eric have gone for the bullseye, the 138? What was it like, you know, from coming from nowhere to win the world title? So it was really. Um, in a way, it, it was lockdown um, that Alex that really made me do it. I mean, I think if, if lockdown had happened, I must probably still wouldn't have done it. But um, a gentleman called Ed, um, Edward Cousin Lake, um, who was a friend of um, Russell, Lord Russell Baker that I know, and uh, he said, well, I'd like to do it. And that's how we did it. And it gave me a chance in lockdown. He would send me, well, he used to put homework, send me <laughs> questions. And it was very hard to keep going back. But I can honestly say everything in that book is true. There's nothing like, I know some people can make things up to make a book look better. Actually, what happened in that book is, is 100%. So, um, yeah, it's been very positive and really enjoyed it. And I remember you said before how you'd been asked for a lot of years by fans to put your story out there in a book. So what was that feeling like when it did finally get published? And you say you were getting a lot of messages from people saying they'd bought it and they'd read it and they'd enjoyed it as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I was really proud in a way. I mean, um, I was really um, pleased and, and I really appreciate Stephen Fry, who did the forward for my book. Um, Stephen came along to the final when Phil had the two nine darters and... Uh, and I always remember saying, um, hello, Mr. Fry. He went, Mr. Della, I know you. Don't... And he was just saying all about the darts he used to watch. And um, he loved our era of darts like he does now. I mean, but he, he remembers all us. Because obviously there was only four channels on TV then. So it was, in a way, I wouldn't say it's more profile, but more people watched it in our day because there was only four channels. When you think 10 million people watched my final against Eric and where you think that nowadays it's on Sky or it could be ITV4, I don't think they would get near those sort of figures and um, and I just dropped the letter to say would you mind saying a few words and he said I'd love to so I really was really honoured actually because he's a such a fantastic person yeah and obviously Phil Taylor um, Phil, um, uh, I said to Phil would you say a few and he said yeah I'd love to mate I've already been good friends with Phil you know, we, I, spoke, I spoke to him a day, actually. I was telling him, is he getting nine darts this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, uh, and I said, I've got a couple of hard games and I've got an easy one when I get to the semis. <laughs> Never mind, Phil. But no, it's, um, it was great. Uh, it's an easy, the greatest time. I don't think you can even do anyone near it. Sorry, Michael, you know, I think Michael's the second best player of all time. But I don't think you could, you could argue with Phil. And it was a great honour as well to have Phil to say some lovely words about me in the book so it was really nice um and also you know as I say people have come up to me and said you know i really enjoyed your book and so you know i'm really pleased and i just hope anybody who buys the book enjoys it and you touched on it as well we've had these world seniors events this year the world championship the world masters as well just touching on the the world championship it was a, a close game with larry butler and as you say it's a first time playing on tv for a long time how did you reflect on that first game back after all those years well i, I thought i'd beat larry butler i didn't lie i mean but the thing is larry's been playing in competitions in america people don't really don't realize you know that competitive darts i mean i was putting in four hours a day three hours a day and you know 180 140 100 180 but you're throwing all the time, you've got no pressure. And players, I mean, there was a perfect example, Robert Ford, you know, I, I, I said that Robert maybe wasn't good enough, didn't play good enough to hold his tour card. I mean, he's a brilliant player, but the bottom line is he didn't have his tour card, he lost it. Robert really was just not playing good enough to be on the tour card, but he was too good for us in the first one. And obviously he must have thought, well, I should beat these guys, really. Um, I mean, maybe Martin Adams. Phil was still rusty. I still think he's still rusty. And, uh, you know, and I just felt that Robert was such a hot favourite. And then when we got to the next one, um, David Cameron played Kevin Painter. And Kevin was unlucky. Um, he could have won that. It was a really good, maybe the best game um, in the tournament, really. I thought the first round that game was. And uh, David Cameron then sort of kicked on really well. Again, a player that's playing competitions. You know, he's, it's 
it is an advantage. I, you know, I'm not going to. I mean, I joined Super League, Alex. I've joined. You know, I played in local tournaments. I mean, I played in one local tournament, and you know, I played brilliant. I know I lost in the last sixteen, but we both were on a hundred average. You know, it is just it's that sort of pressure that you need to play and unfortunately we just and, and I'll tell you what's hers as well exhibitions I know people say yeah but you don't always play a lot of good players but you go three hours away to a town and people are paid money to come and watch you you've got to play well so there is pressure but you're on, on the board all night so it is a big advantage so yeah, I, I found it Super League I went first Super League game I was a bit nervous I thought God I haven't played Super League for 20 years <laughs> yeah. so it was really like going back in time for me but I needed to play under pressure I still felt that at the Masters um, just too many loose shots are doing me at the moment and that's what I've been trying to work on why, why am I doing it and it really is well I've just tried a bit too hard so uh, I, the reason, and you know, I thought, well, how can I still try and get better? So I spoke to um, Jason Tame and Georgie Noble, and I said, can I ever go at the online darts? And I'll be honest with you, Alex, I know, I knew I was going to get my backside kicked. I mean, Jesus, I mean, these guys, they they want to get back on the main tour, so they shouldn't be losing to sixty-two-year-olds, should they? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, I mean, difference between me and Martin Adams. Martin's been playing on a lot of these all year, so he's a lot sharper. But if you ask Martin, he didn't play well in the last series event. So there's no guarantees. But I went along to the online darts and uh, I thought, well, this would be interesting. And my first game uh, was Robert Owen. And he decided, decided to put 103 average in, which, uh, and I lost 4 2. But I took a couple of good finishes out. And I thought, well, that ain't bad. And then I played a, a guy from Northern Ireland. And he did play well against me. I think he had 101 average. And I thought, wow, OK, move on. <laughs> and then I think I had another game. I'd lost 4-2. And then I lost another one, um, 4-2. Uh, so Lee, Lee Evans. And uh, I thought, well, you know, apart from that, I didn't get hammered. But they were so much sharper than me. That was the difference. And the next night, my first game, I felt more comfortable the second night. I thought, I know what to expect now. And I played Lee Evans. I was 2-0 down. And I think I went... 171.94 out, uh, 88 on the ball. And the last leg, I went 140, out and two darts, 14 darts. And I think that would do me good for Friday. I felt that I'm playing players I know that are better than me. Look, I know I'm the underdog on Friday, but I don't think I'm much a much underdog. I know that yeah, I can beat uh, Colin, Colin McGarry. I can beat him on Friday, and, and uh, he'll be very confident in beating me. So it's good, and I think as... Fingers crossed that you know I, I can. Pl I know I'm playing in the one in next February, the Worlds Seniors, and hopefully I'll be out playing a few more the next few years, and I'll get better because I know that my practice is. I'll just keep practicing hard. I'm getting a lot of exhibitions coming now, which is great. So it's gonna. You know, I'm gonna get sharper, and I'll, I'll do the online again. I thought it was great. I think it's a fantastic um, thing what they're doing, and it really does sharpen you up because it really is tough. You go in a room there, and it's just you, the referee, and the, your opponent. It's it's tough, but it's a really good learning curve and, and for playing under pressure. Just quickly touching on that World Seniors Masters, we did see you get that win against Bob Anderson, and we'll probably remember that event. One of the reasons we'll remember it is your celebrations early on against Richie House and some liking them to go in price. I remember you said before about how when you won the first set against Phil at a World Championship, you really milked it. Was it the same thing with this as well? Yeah, I just thought, I just wanted to make a little reminder that he's not going to get it all his own way. And then he said to me, oh, he went, Jesus, you, you come out, you come at me. And, uh, and I thought, well, why shouldn't I? You know, I've been world champion. And at the end of the day, I always say that at the players, I mean, John Lowe hasn't played his best, but John Lowe has been one of our greatest players of all time. John Lowe could well Kate will go up there. Obviously, Kevin Payne is going to be a really hot favourite, but John might just come out and be the John Lowe of old. You just don't know. It's You always got to give respect to the players that have done it because they won't be scared to do it again. Some of the other players, you've got to say, well, you know, are they used to TV? Are they going to be as confident as we think? You don't know that. And uh, I just feel that there's no pressure on me. At the end of the day, I've, I've done my bit in the history of the darts. Uh, Colin, nice guy. I've met Colin a few times. Very good dart player. But 
you know, I'm not, I'm not worried. I'm just going to give it a go and hopefully entertain the fans. And I shall, if I take something out good, I'm going to give it. No <laughs> worry. Yeah. And also, the the red trousers are coming out again. <laughs> Great to see. You. It's been great to see the red trousers. Great to see yourself and a lot of the other players back on our screens. The, the walk-ons as well. We have to mention your walk-on. Things can only get better. What was your reaction when you found out that Damon Hetter was using the song as well? Well, I said to him, I went, "You should be coming on to the heat is on." Because he yeah. nicknamed the heat, is it? You should be coming on to something like that. He, he should be taken by one. But anyway, but people, uh, he's done fantastic. Him and Simon win the World World Cup pairs. I was really chuffed for him. I just thought it was fantastic. Um, in memory of Kyle Anderson as well but um, you know it was a great and it was nice that they dedicated that to Kyle he was such a lovely man and, uh, and a brilliant dart player but it's uh, yeah it was quite strange when I heard him I said to him what are you doing <laughs> and he was like um, Alan Warren would um, cold his eyes but it was something we'd go with Price but I don't mind to be honest it's uh, it's all good fun if he wants to use it if anybody else wants to I, I, I don't really mind but that, I'll always still come out to it and I, I have to I mean if I was to change it they'll say no no you can't do that <laughs> it's just a great I mean I've got to be honest uh, we've been very lucky because I said that, uh, I think I said before that, that the reasons why we've got the world seniors it's given us our you know last hurrah it's the last chance of being in the limelight and it's fantastic and I feel that um, Jason Tame, Jason Francis, who Jason Francis, obviously Ronnie O'Sullivan's manager, Jason Tame, Michael Bangoans, you know, they've done, they've worked really hard. Jennings, the sponsors, they've been fantastic. They've backed all of the events. And we've had other sponsors helping out as well. And uh, obviously getting on BT Sport, which is fantastic as well. It's, it's a lot of hard work. And the Circus Tavern was fantastic. They really did push the event very well for us. And also the bonus arena have. I think we could have been a bit more supported at Lakeside, but unfortunately, you know, it wasn't to be. But at the end of the day, it's an, it's you know it's an iconic venue. But I think we could have really pushed harder and it got a bigger crowd. So that was a little bit disappointing for me. But I'm really looking forward to the bonus arena. I know they've really been pushing it, and this is going to be a, a fantastic event. Obviously, Phil's the favourite, and if the real Phil Saver turns up, then and then we're all in trouble. <laughs> so, but I just think it's, I think what's nice, when you go there, I mean, at the, fir- at the last event, I gave away a set sign of Loxley, Keith Della Darts and a shirt, a 138 shirt, and we've done it as a fancy dress, and it was, they really liked it. So this Friday, uh, there'll be another um, shirt, a 138 shirt that I play in. Um, I'm going to sign that, and we'll do another fancy dress, just to sort of say thank you to the people that are supporting the event. And, Obviously, you know, this, the tickets are still available. It's, it's, you know, I know they're going well, but the more the merrier. Definitely, yeah, it's a, a nice touch. And this year as well, we've, we've had the World Seniors come in, which has been great to see. A lot of new events this year. Another one, which we've got next month, the Women's World Match Play at the Winter Gardens. You said to us last time you thought Lisa Ashton was the best ladies player right now. She's proven it on the Women's Series, top of that list, Fallon at number two. What have you made of the Women's Series and how do you see this first Women's World Match Play playing out? I just hope they, I mean, we expect Lisa to play really well. We expect Fallon to play really well. I love to see Bo Greaves in there. To me, I think she's an unbelievable dart player. And I think if Bo would have been in there as well, I think she would have rattled Fallon and Lisa big time, personally. So, and it might be been good. But, you know, no, she didn't play in the qualifier. So, obviously, she can't play at Blackpool. So, that's right. But, obviously, the, them two are way above the other girls. But, it's a chance for the other six to try and uh, win the tournament. I think that it's it's a real big thing for the lady darts because, you know, if the standard doesn't do well, then people will start saying, well, is it worth it sort of thing. But I think uh, I think they'll play really well. I think there's some good players. Laura Turner, Laura who works for Sky with us. I like to see Laura win it, obviously, because <laughs> she uh, works for Sky like I do. So, uh, I, but there's some you know, good players. I need Graf, Lorraine Wynn Stanley, and I mean, they're all good players. So, and they can all play, and they can all beat Lisa and Fallon. But you just feel that you know. I think people will want to see Lisa against Fallon in the final, and then really fight it out, and then we'll know who the best is. Definitely, and away from the darts, we spoke about it before. You being a big Ipswich Town fan, and what a draw in the League Cup playing my team, Owen Binks's team, Colin Lloyd's team, the pride of Anglia, Colchester United. Once Colchester knock Ipswich out of the cup, you can focus on the league. How do you see the season going for Ipswich? 
I think we'll have a big season. I think we've still got maybe another two or three players to come in. Maybe um, we, I think last year, no disrespect, Paul Cook. He, I met I met Paul. He, he, he's before he's a nice guy, but I didn't like him running out before the players. I didn't get all that. It's like he's the first player on the pitch, but didn't get that personally. Um, and I feel that he just. Uh, this didn't work. I think that um, the format, he never changed. Um, Kieran, the new manager, is just quietly good, brilliant what he's done. He's, he's obviously got a lot of experience under Mourinho and the people like, you know, like that. So it's going to help. The standard of football now is so much better. It's quick. I mean, the, we've got a really good side. We, be honest with you, last year, I would say 90% of the teams we outplayed, I think the only team that really outplayed us twice was Bolton. They beat us twice. And apart from that, we, we just didn't put the ball in the net. And that was the problem. And um, we, got, we brought a few players in. I feel that with 16,000 tickets sold already, um, so we know that every home game next year is going to be 22, 23,000. So it's a big... And getting Colchester, I don't think... Like before, maybe there's a few players not playing. I think this one, because I've got to be honest, when you play this in that well, a waste of time, competition what was it Johnson Paint or whatever it was yeah I, I went to that and god they were Colchester fans were loud but the thing is it was like do they I don't think they were really I don't think they're bothered about that competition I mean I, if you ask the town fans could we not play in that they'd say yes please but the Carabao Cup is the league cup and I think uh, there'll be at least 20,000 there that night and uh, we're gonna have to put you boys to bed I did say that um, Binks I said look Banks I said look mate remember we're playing a little club down the road, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and we have had a little, we've had a little bet, we have. I've said that Colchester don't make the, the playoffs, the top seven, and he said Ipswich won't make the top six. So we've had, we've had two little fun bets. And, uh, you know, so... But I like... I, look, yeah, I love to see Colchester win League Two because it's a local club, isn't it? I can't say the same about Norwich, unfortunately. No, I never want to see Norwich do well. But that's just the way it is. But Colchester, I like to see do well. Cambridge are just down the road. I mean, you know, they but they beat us the, like this year, so the last season, so they're on the hit list. But I think I think we'll I think we'll go up this year. And uh, you know, we're very lucky that we've got fantastic owners. Um got Ed Sheeran on the shirt, sponsors, and profile for our club now is fantastic. It's it's very promising, but you can't win it by talking. You've got to do it on the pitch. It's the same with darts. You can talk it on the practice board, but you've got to do it on that stage under the lights and the cameras. So I always sort of just hopefully, fingers crossed, that we'll get out of this um, pub league, I call it, the league one. <laughs> you know, some of the pitches. I mean, I don't agree personally with the cap, salary cap. I mean, how can a team that only has 3,000 at home spend, spend the same amount of money as we can? I don't agree with that. So... That's like saying, well, Man City, the Premier League. Watford couldn't spend two hundred million like Man City, could they? So why why don't they make that fairer? But it just seems that it's all about League One. You're going to get the the bad salary cap. So you know, it's up to the clubs to manage their affairs properly and and do it right, really, isn't it? So, but hopefully we'll go up and uh, we'll take Colchester. Sorry, and we'll. We'll get another home tie in round two. <laughs> yeah. Well, may the best team win when that game comes around. Keith, always a pleasure to chat to you. We appreciate the time and best of luck with the World Seniors this weekend and what else is to come in 2022. I'm really looking forward to it and wish everybody good darting, keep well and keep healthy. Thanks, Alex. Take care, mate. Thanks again to Keith for joining us. And it's another busy weekend this weekend. We've got the Euro Tour back. We've also got the World Seniors match play what most catches your eye about this weekend's lineup of action? I've talked. We've talked a little bit about our views on the uh, World Series. Well, at least I have. I think you. Uh, it was while you were gone for those couple of weeks. But I remember talking to Han about it. Not the World Series. The uh, uh, World Seniors. All things considered, a bit over it. I understand the appeal of having a World Championship, but having a full tour. Well, I understand why it's there. I don't see the appeal to watch it. I do not grow up with most of these players. Um, they were before my time. Obviously, some of the players who are dominating the tour aren't that far removed from playing on the PDC and dominating on the PDC, including all-time great Robert Thornton, who became the world senior champion. But they can still go and play in the PDC and do so at a high level. So I don't really feel 
the personal need to go watch it. It might be different to go see it in person. If I was over there, I think that could be fun. Uh, but I'm not going to take time out of my day to watch all but maybe the finals of uh, the senior events. Um, it is still fun to follow. And if Mark Walsh had qualified, that would have changed things as well. Uh, but unfortunately, he didn't. Um, but the Euro Tour event, I am more interested in, not just because, well, it's going to be a much higher standard, but also because we are now really getting close to the cutoff for the world match play. And we keep alluding to that. We keep bringing it up. But the world match play is the second most important event, at least ranking event on the PDC calendar. If you want to say the Premier League's more important, it does have a bigger prize fund, fine, but it's not a ranking event. And there's spots to be had in the world match play. And be even beyond that, we're not that far off from the end of the season. It's weird thinking that there's still over six months until we crown a world champion, but there's under five months until, uh, we set the field for the world championships and really under four months until the pro tour season comes to an end. Um, And there's some players in this field that have work to do just to get to the world championships among the qualifiers. Ian White is currently not in the world championships as hard as that is to believe Steve Lennon also not after being in the last four or five years, they are both in this field as the, uh, as tour card qualifiers beyond that, there's uh, um, Jermaine Wadamaina, also among the pro tour qualifiers for here, who has a lot of work to do. Um, And these are players who, well, Steve Lennon's only made the world match play once, but Ian White's been in every year. Jermaine Wadamain has been in four years in a row. And not just are they not in the picture for the world match play, but they're not in the picture for the world championship right now. That just tells you how important these events are and what, and with the prize money that's at stake, you get a thousand pounds for qualifying, but each match after that is at least a thousand pounds more than that. If you win two matches, you're up to three thousand pounds. You win another, it's another two thousand on that to five thousand. And the time is now to start getting results. We don't yet know what the draw is. It very well could be Ian White draw Steve Lennon in the first round, and both of them need results just to make the world championships, and one of them won't get it if that happens. But they also could get some of the uh regional qualifiers who they keep getting better. Uh, but you would expect on their day for Ian White or uh, uh, Steve Lennon to beat them. So I, I think that's the big thing. But beyond that, you know, there's also, as we keep talking about, who's going to be the next first time Euro Tour winner? And there's so many players in very good form that still haven't won a Euro Tour event. We talked about Dirk van Dijvenboot, who hasn't won a stage event of any kind in the PDC earlier. Is this his time? Well, we don't know the full draw yet, but he gets if he gets through the matches and the seeds get through, Peter Wright, who's really been struggling as of late, waits as his potential third round matchup. And then either Jose de Salsa or Nathan Aspinall, who've both been hit or miss this year. There's been moments of brilliance from both of them, but there's also been moments where they do not look like they should be seated. So it's an opportunity for Dirk van Dijvenboda to go on a run. Um, but who could potentially wait in the semifinals? Rob Cross, who's another one on that list of players who still haven't won it. Dimitri Vandenberg still hasn't won it. He's in the opposite half of the draw, along with Ryan Searle, Damon Hedda, Joe Cullen, who has won one, but uh, still a very good player. Um, so who's going to be the next first-time Euro Tour winner is another thing to look forward to because there's just such a good field here of players who still haven't won one. It's tough to talk about it until we've seen the draw. That will change things, but there's a lot of players who we keep talking about in that conversation for best who have yet to win one, who are going to come into this in very good form. Is this the weekend for them? We'll see. Is it just going to be another one for Luke Humphreys? Well, that's also very possible because remember, he's won the last two he played in because he skipped the last one. Um, So can he make it three in a row? Another thing to look forward to. Definitely is. I'll start off with the the World Seniors like you did. And I think for a lot of us, the first one, the World Seniors Championship back in February, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of hype going into that one, that being the first one. And we'd had, I think it was pretty much 12 months of build up from the event being announced to then happening at the Circus Tavern. The second one, yeah, I, I don't think there was as much of excitement among darts fans for that one. And we come on to this third one, the, the World Seniors match play this weekend. And again, I think the interest level may have dropped among among the watching darts fans, but just looking at the draw, looking at the players that are going to be involved, and there is some games definitely there that I'm looking forward to watching the first couple of days. And starting off with the very first one, we've got 
Dieter Hedman against Trina Gulliver, one of the great rivalries that we've seen in the ladies game over the last 10, 15 years and getting to see those two go up against each other on stage again, something that we don't often see these days. So that's going to be a, a good game to start things off with that. I guess you can say with these events, that nostalgia, if you like, thinking back to the great battles that they've had in the past and the winner plays the best ever, Phil Taylor, later on that evening as well. So again, something for those two to play for to then go up against Phil Taylor later on in the evening. Some other games from those those first couple of rounds that I'm looking forward to, John Park, Peter Manley. Again, that's a rivalry that I think when I was first started watching darts the early 2000s, those two were among the best players in the world. John Park, of course, a, a world champion, and Peter Manley, a world number one around that era. So looking forward to seeing those two go up against each other. And got to give a mention as well to, to Peter Everson, the guest on the show this week. Think back to when we had him on around this time last year and we were talking about the lineup for this first World Seniors and yeah, some of his comments they, they didn't go down too well about him not being invited, but he has got the invite for this one. He is a former world match play champion, so I'm looking forward to seeing him in action. Larry Butler's back involved in this one as well. Ronnie Baxter, we're gonna see him playing it as well. We've not seen him play for a while, so again, I think it's that nostalgia value if you like for these events, seeing some of the players that we've not seen for a little while or, or don't see as often now. As far as the Euro Tour, again, like you say, the, the draw is not out, but from what we uh, from what we can see, as, as you say, Luke Humphreys, he's won his last two Euro Tours, missed the last one. Can he do something that not many people have done, win three Euro Tours in a row? That's one of the, the big questions going into it. A few other things I was looking at as well, and uh, Ross Montgomery, I believe this is his first European Tour event, if you'd have said that this time last year, Ross Montgomery playing on the Euro Tour, you'd have had a, a few funny looks coming your way. But he is a, a tour card holder. He did win the qualifier and we are going to see him in, in Germany this weekend. So, again, something to look forward to. Ross Montgomery playing on the, a Euro Tour for a first time, something we've not seen. Scott Williams, uh, a guest that we had on the show last week. Of course, he is a non-tour card holder, but he has qualified for this event via the associate member qualifier. And you mentioned that race to the world match play. He's a, a title winner a couple of weeks ago on the Pro Tour. He's not very far off those world match play spots. And as he pointed out to me last week, there's now four players championship events before the cutoff um, end of next week, going into the following week. So he's going to be in all of those. He's going to be in the Euro tour this weekend, a couple of wins this weekend, some good runs next week. We could be talking about a non tour cut holder being in the world match play. So that's definitely something to look forward to some other players as well that are in it this weekend. Mervyn King, Roby John Rodriguez, more than capable of going on a deep run, getting into those world match play spots. And just lastly on the Euro Tour as well, this is going to be the last stage event before the world match play. So you've got the likes of Peter Wright, defending champion of the world match play last year, Gerwin Price, Michael Van Gerwin, Michael Smith, Johnny Clayton, who all had those first round defeats in Amsterdam at the weekend. They'll all want to go into this weekend, go on a deep run, lift the title, give themselves a bit of confidence going into the world match play in a few weeks. Good point about Ross Montgomery that I want to slip my mind. I, I, I still don't believe it. Uh, even though, <laughs> uh, But now we'll move on to our third and final interview on this week's show, and it's with Peter Everson. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the former world master, former world match play champion, Peter Everson. Thanks for the time, Peter. How are you doing? Yeah, good, mate. Uh, just on the ball to try to get the arm ticking over again. Well, we're talking at the start of a week, which sees you make your return to televised darts, playing in the World Seniors match play and hole this weekend. How are you feeling as we count down the days now? Nervous, excited, a mixture of both? Uh, a bit of a mixture of both. Uh, a bit worried about my arm at the moment, but uh, still having a bit of treatment on it. So uh, we we'll just have to wait and see uh, how it feels you know, on the day, I guess. Well, we'll come back to this weekend, but let's rewind back to when we last had you on our show. We had you on as part of our Darts Legend series almost a year ago now, and it was just before the 25-year anniversary of your World Match Play title win back in 1996. Did you do anything yourself to mark the occasion? Not really, no. I just uh, watched the darts on the telly and uh, thought about, you know, all the good memories that I had at Blackpool and... Uh, what a good times with all the, all the all the guys that were there, and it's, yeah, it's you know it's not very often you uh, can recap 25 years of uh, the match play. Yeah. Well, last year we did see the World Match Play return to Blackpool. We saw a, a new name 
go on that trophy Peter Wright lifting the title last summer a lot of plaudits for his run to the title that week you said you were watching it some calling it Phil Taylor-esque given the level that he played at what did you make of it? Uh, yeah I mean Peter's a class player anyway and uh, I just you know he deserved it he said he was going to win it and he won it so you know it's fair play to him and uh, you know it's going to be interesting to see who wins it again this year well, back to you. And when we last had you on, we mentioned the world scene yes, was coming soon. You hadn't received a reply to your text to the organisers to play. Fast forward to January and your name is announced for this World Seniors match play. What did they say to you when they came calling to invite you for this event? Uh, you know, they, they sort of said I've won the uh, World Match Play and, uh, you know, would I accept the invitation to play in uh, the seniors? And... Uh, my reply was yes, but uh, I also won, you know, the World Masters. And with his reply, I said, uh, yes, we, we, we know that. So I still didn't get the invite, but, uh, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's down to the organisers and uh, what they say goes and they pick who they want to pick. But uh, I think if you've got the right to be there, you should be there. Right? So, and I've made, you know, I've done a few interviews and I'm, it's come across as you know, if they've got a problem then they've got a problem there's nothing to do with me I remember chatting to you last year and I know you were disappointed not to have got an invite for that first event the World Championship when the organisers yeah. did call did they give you an explanation or did you ask for one as to why you missed out uh, they just you know basically said uh, I thought they'd pick the, the right lot I mean it's their view and that they think you know if they then people put bums on seats and uh, that's who they've picked and, you know, it's up to them, you know what I mean? They don't pick uh, people on ability, do they? It's not just pick people on uh, the past and how they are with the crowd. I mean, if they would pick the people that have done things and won things, then half of them players would have been there. So, but uh, they had my views and yeah. let's see what happens next year. Well, we did have that first World Seniors event back in February. It seemed to go down well with the fans. Did you watch any of it on TV? And if you did, what was your opinion on that first event? Yeah, I watched it. Uh, Robert Fulton looked uh, a different league to the rest of the players. But, you know, should he have been in it? You know, he, he was still playing on the PDC circuit on the Challenge Tour. I think he had an advantage to everybody else. Uh, so was it fair? Probably not. So, you know, at the end of the day, he took the opportunity and ran away with it. It's, in my eyes, he shouldn't have been it. Well, as we mentioned, your invite for the match play was announced in January, so it's been the best part of six months build up to this weekend, getting up on the stage for you. How has the preparation gone for this return? Uh, I mean, I put, I put in a, quite a bit of practice uh, we've been to see a physio we've been to uh, London to try and get my nerves sorted out in my, my neck and my arm uh, the only thing I haven't tried is cortisone and it, I've left it a bit late for that so all it's done is uh, made me put hard work in and uh, see what happens I'm still in a bit of pain but you know that's, that's fine so before getting this invite then, how much darts had you been playing? Were you still playing in, in any local leagues or events or was it just the odd throw here and there at home? No, i just go out and play on a Friday night with the lads and uh, you know, just have a game. But uh, since then, I've been putting in more time and more practice three times a week, four hours at a time, just getting, hopefully getting ready for the day. And you mentioned you've had to work around the, the injuries as, as well. Where would you say your game is at heading into this weekend? Uh, I don't really know, to be quite honest. It's, you know, one day I'm playing OK, the next day my arm's killing me and I'm back trying to fix me up. So it's, uh, it's all to do with you know how your nerves are in, in your shoulders and going down your arm. Uh, but uh, I should have a rest before... Probably on the Thursday and the Friday, rest my arm and, and uh, Saturday. But I'm looking forward to it. That's the main thing. 
Good to hear. And we, we saw you make the trip to Reading a, a few weeks ago to watch those qualifiers for the match play. Was that to scout out one of your potential opponents or was it to get a gauge on what the, the standard's been like? Uh, a bit of both. You know, and obviously to see uh, who's, who's going to be the... Uh, and no, I was quietly surprised with the uh, the standard, and you know, there's of course there's good players out there. And, uh, you've just got to up your game. If you don't up your game, you're going to be uh, going home. So it just makes you more determined and more, you know, putting in a bit more time and a bit more effort. And, you know, it's only a few days to go, and you've got. You've got to get your ass into gear and get frame of mind. If you don't, if you're in the wrong frame of mind, you ain't, you ain't going to win. So get up there and get it done. One of those potential opponents is Northern Ireland's Colin McGarry. He was the, the highest non-qualifier on that order merit. The other is Keith Deller. The two of them facing off on Friday with the winner to play you. What was your reaction when you saw the draw? I was pleased with it. Uh, you know, Colin McGarry's uh, playing well. He's averaging between say 85 and 95 and you know that's, that's what you've got to look at uh, I can't do anything about their game all I can do is my game trust if I play to my ability then you know it's going to be a good game but uh, we will see it's going to be interesting and your first game is going to be Saturday afternoon you play the winner of that game a uh, first game on TV I want to say probably since the old League of Legends on Satanta 2008. So how much are you looking forward to being back playing on TV again? Yeah, it's, it's funny, really. You know, I've been at... Uh, I've been to a few PDC events that look like the World Championship and things like that. And uh, always wanted to be back there. And now I've got my opportunity. So I've got to grab it with both hands and go running. And you mentioned there you've been to some PDC events recently at the, the World Championship. When you go to those events as a player that's been right at the, the top of the game, do you still get those same emotions when you're walking into the arena thinking, oh, I want to get up on that stage again? Oh, yes, yeah. I thought, you know, that's the main thing. Uh, I accepted this because I wanted to get up there and then, uh, and, and try, you know, just to see what happens and, you know, mix with all, all the old guys that I used to travel around with. So it's, uh, it's going to be nice to see them all again and uh, talk about old times and that, which uh, we always do. So it's going to be interesting, fun and uh, hopefully enjoyable. Yeah, we'll get to hear you walk out to the Eye of the Tiger again, one of the iconic walk-on songs in darts. What do you think that moment's going to be like when you walk out onto the stage and in front of that crowd again? Uh, it's going to be... Uh, Probably a bit emotional, to be quite honest. Uh, it's, it's been a while, and uh, yeah, never thought it'd happen again. So there you go. You just got to grab it with both hands. And you, got, you get opportunities in life. You don't, you know, you don't reject them. You just take them and run with it. And uh, that's the aim. You know, it's, it's hopefully one of many. And uh, you just got to get out of there. No. hopefully the arm's going to be okay and then go from there if it don't if it doesn't work it doesn't work uh, then the step forward is just to have a quarter zone so we will see well as this is the, the first time we'll have seen you play on TV for a while I think in the League of Legends you had the Tigers on your shirt as a nod to your nickname the Fen Tiger can we expect something similar again yeah I've got uh, Tiger on my trousers as well as my shirt uh so it's going to be uh, a nice shiny shoes. So it's going to be uh, yeah, the your tie. Your tie is going to be okay. Or you know, it's important to look good. And uh, at least I'll be doing that part right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very nice. And and lastly, away from the darts, we know you're a big Chelsea fan as well. A good start to the year, winning the the Club World Cup, but losing out to Liverpool in those two other finals. How do you see next season going for Chelsea? Yeah. All depends on the you know the new setup. Rudy, Rudy's gone, and uh, we're going to have a new few new ones coming in. It's going to be uh, yeah. It's, I've got so 
so much on at the moment. It's, uh, I'm moving house. I'm going on holiday on the 5th of July. Uh, and I've got final practice for this. So it, it's... Chelsea's uh, gonna, <laughs> it's on the back burner at the moment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, you know, I'll, I'll be going to as many games as I can. And But there's more important things that I've got to concentrate on at the moment. Yeah, it's definitely a busy time. Well, hope the rest of the week the prep goes well for you, Peter. Congratulations on getting the call-up well-deserved for this World Seniors and wish you all the best for this weekend and what else is to come in 2022 as well. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Yes, I should be trying and hopefully be talking to you again soon. Thanks to Peter for joining us this week. Now we'll end with a pair of listener questions. We'll do these little rapid fire the first one comes from gareth hughes who says with ticket sales so poor for the women's uh world match play would have been better off to add one women's match to the end or not to the end but to each session uh than to have the women's final as a precursor to the main event on sunday evening yeah possibly i don't think it's a a bad idea and i was just looking actually to try and find out what the ticket sales are like for the the women's world match play that sunday afternoon session before the the final with the world match play and I can't really see how many tickets have been sold haven't been sold but just based on how many tickets are available and aside from that session all, all the other sessions are pretty much sold out not many tickets left and looking at the prices I think it was 26 pounds for a table 21 pounds for a balcony so they are the cheapest sessions of the week so I think now that we do have the lineup for the event hopefully the tickets all start to sell pretty quickly and the weekend of it as well there's a, a lot of darts fans that head up to Blackpool for the week head up for the the two weekends either one of them and you know it's a chance to go to the Winter Gardens watch the event I think it's um yeah I, I think the tickets will sell out pretty well to us as we get closer to the event I think at the moment maybe there's not been that much publicity about it but now that we know we are going to see the likes of Lisa Fallon a few of the other big names are going to be involved in this I think we'll, we'll see the tickets start to sell and Fingers crossed we'll see a, a good turnout because, yes, we could have had it where you had one match added on to each session, but I don't think this is what the event is about. I don't think this is why the PDC have done it. They want to give the ladies that spotlight for that afternoon. All the eyes are going to be on them for that one session. So for me, I, I like the idea of having just that one session, all the ladies' events, uh, all the ladies' matches in that one session for me is a, a good idea. And, and hopefully we'll see the, the darts fans pick up those tickets and we'll see a good crowd for it. Yeah, I under I understand the point of making it a focus uh, and making it its own standalone event, and I applaud the PDC for having done that um, and giving it it's giving it a chance. And there's still time to go; it could still sell out. Uh, but in terms of overall growing the women's game and growing uh, the market uh, for the game, having a having one match across seven consecutive sessions, I think would have been better. And it would have also, I mean, it would have drawn out the event. And I guess there is something to be said about with the prize money being what it is and most of these players having to work full-time jobs, it might just not have been sensible for them to have uh, to have drawn it out over a week and had the players potentially have to be there a full week. Um, but it would have brought more uh, spotlight to it. And it would have um, had the players playing um, in front of, an audience that was already tuned in already there. Um, I think it can go both ways for that reason. I think it would have been a better spectacle having the matches intertwined, but it also might not have been realistic for that reason of having to have the players be there for a full week, maybe having two matches um, per session across uh, three sessions. And then the final on Sunday as a precursor could have worked a little bit better. And that way they would have only had to be there from Thursday on. Um, and it would have still mixed in, but I can understand it both ways. Uh, I, I, I'm neutral on it. I think it was a tough decision to make. Uh, I lean towards uh, disagreeing with it, but I understand it. And our last listener question comes from our guest co-host last week, Andrew Sinclair inside the WDF. He says a number of big name players, missing out on the women's world match play how many of their absences could be described as crimes yeah yeah i I mean i don't think any could be described as crimes and i did kind of talk about this earlier but some certainly don't seem fair um especially rihanna sullivan because she played 
all um, 12 events, and she played at the highest standard of other than Lisa Ashton or Fallon Sherrick in terms of average of anyone who played all 12 events. And she kept, uh, I mean, she started out the season slow. She only got one win from her first three events, and that's what really ended up doing her in. But as it went on, she kept playing well and kept running into players who were playing very well. She went out with a nearly 90 average in her last match, going out to Lisa Ashton. She went out to Lisa Ashton um, two other times um, in the money end of uh, the tournament. Uh, quarterfinal loss, and I guess the last 32 is in the money end. But she was averaging mid-80s in that. Uh, so she was playing really well and getting better. But the results at the beginning is what did her in. And can you call it a crime? When uh, you go out first round twice and second round the next event from the first three events and then a couple other second round exits later on, I don't know. Granted, one of those uh, she played well in, but she she left herself too much to do and she still almost managed to do enough to get there, still finishing in the top uh, 10. I think Rhiannon Sullivan, assuming this event happens next year, will be there. She's the closest for it up. Uh, to being able to call it a crime. Makura Suzuki missed a weekend, and that's what kept her out. Um, but both of them, if they play the full thing next year, you'd think they would get there. They are among the best players in the women's game right now, um, and uh, hopefully will be in it next year. Yeah, we should mention, for those who didn't see, this is a, a nod to our friend uh, Yetzi on, on Twitter, who said that it would be a, a crime if... Rihanna Sullivan didn't qualify for the women's world match play. And it is, it is a fair point, isn't it? Because she was one of the top performers across the women's series. And in, in fairness, though, she has only got herself to blame, hasn't she? Because she did get to that final of the second event on the Saturday against Raymond Stanley. And she did have the match starts to beat her. And if she'd have won that game, won the title, an extra £400, that would have ended up being enough to, to get into this field. So she's going to be very disappointed not to make the field, given how she played across the, the three weekends with, with her overall average. And she's been in some good form this year. She made the semi-finals at Lakeside. She's made some finals as well, the, the Dutch Open, the, the Six Nations as well. So she's one of the top ladies in the game at the moment. So it is a shame to see her miss out, as it is Makuru Suzuki as well. And missing that first weekend, I think that's probably been what's cost her because I think as I said on last week's show if she'd have matched what she did on that second weekend this past weekend she uh she picked up uh, 950 pounds on that second weekend if she'd have done that again again that would have been enough for her to get in that top eight but wasn't to be for her she's missed out Trina Gulliver I think is, is the other name there she didn't play at the weekend and she was in the spots going into it and she did of course win one of those titles this season as well so it's a shame we didn't get to see her in that but one thing I did want to mention as well, and I forgot to mention it earlier as well, is with this first women's world match play, for me, I don't know what you think about this, Burton, but I'd think about naming the trophy the, the Stacey Bromberg trophy. This is going to be the first women's event we've had at the Winter Gardens since Stacey won that, the, the only PDC Women's World Championship. So I think that might be a nice little touch. What do you reckon? I'm fully on board with that suggestion. Of course, Stacey Bromberg, for those who don't, uh, remember won the only PDC Women's World Championship uh, now 12 years ago. And that final, of course, was on the stage at the Winter Gardens during the World Match Play as she uh, beat uh, Trisha Wright in a last leg thriller. Uh, anything else for this week, though? As always, I've got to say a big thank you to our guests for joining us. Congratulations again to Yellow on winning the Dutch Open title. I've got to say thanks to Keith and Peter for joining us. Best of luck to those two and all the players in hold for the World Seniors this weekend. Thank you to our listeners for joining us. We appreciate the support. Big thanks to our sponsor, Dartwolf. Head on over to dartwolf.tv. Give Dartwolf a follow at dartwolf180. Great to have you back on the show this week, Burton, to chat to you again. And the darts calendar is it's not slowing down, is it? So um, we'll be back again, same time, same place next week. But until then, enjoy the darts. Yes, as, as Yella Klassen says, enjoy the darts. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, of course, as you said, we'll be back next week. Uh, recap another big weekend and look ahead to the last quartet of players championship events before the cutoff for the world match play lots to uh still lots to do though still lots to talk about and well i should say let me correct that the last quartet of players championship events before the cutoff for the uh open version of the world match play the women's uh, field's already set uh, but yes we'll be back next week until then 
um, hang tight and enjoy the darts. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of darts to enjoy. Enjoy the darts.